Good afternoon. Many thanks for asking me to talk today. Um, I'm just going to talk about ovarian cancer. And all images have been consented by patients, so um, apologies for the first image. This is the kind of patient we see in our, in our clinics. This is a 65-year-old lady who presented with abdominal distension. She had symptoms of weight loss. She also had symptoms of her clothes weren't fitting her, and her bowels weren't working very well. She had a CA125, which was a tumor marker for ovarian cancer, which is elevated. She was very symptomatic. The next slide is a CT scan of her abdomen around her liver. And the back is her spine, and the front is the front of the abdomen, and the liver is just there. And you can see kind of areas there of blackness, and that's just fluid, and that's called ascites. This is a CT of her pelvis, and again, the back is where the spine, and there are the hip bones, and the front is her abdomen, and there is a large ovarian mass, and showing lots of cysts in the ovary. And this is her ovary that came out of her abdomen. So this, unfortunately, was her ovarian cancer. So in Ireland, the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is one in 73 women will get ovarian cancer. And that's from the data of 2008, 2010. And 345 women in Ireland were diagnosed last year with ovarian cancer. The lifetime risk of dying from ovarian cancer, unfortunately, is one in 95 for the general population. And it's the sixth most common cancer in women in Ireland, and the fifth most common cancer for women who pass away from it. So who gets ovarian cancer, and what ages? Well, this is a graph, and at the bottom is the age from zero to 90 years of age. And we can see that it's very rare to get it under the age of 30. And as we get older, the median age is between 60 and 70 years of age. What are the symptoms of ovarian cancer? Well, they're very nonspecific and they can be persistent. You can get bloating, pelvic or abdominal pain. You might find it difficult to eat. You might not feel like eating. You might have weight loss. You might find you want to go to loo a lot. And the most common symptom is that you present with a big swollen abdomen. Other symptoms reported are kind of you feel absolutely tired. You've got indigestion, back pain, you can't have sexual intercourse, constipation, and you might have irregular bleeding. Well, if we look at the risk factors, I'm not going to go too much on them that we've been talked about today. There's the BRCA and there's the Lynch type 2. Lynch type 2 is associated with colon cancer, while the BRCA gene is associated with ovarian cancer and breast cancer. And it has been discussed today, so I'm going to avoid the BRCA. So the annual incidence of women aged between 50 and 75 years of age is around 50 per 100,000. It's twice the rate in younger women. And how can we decrease our risk of developing ovarian cancer? Well, I think having loads of babies is very protective. Being on the oral concept of pill is protective because you don't ovulate. Breastfeeding is, shows support as well. Tubal ligation, I really don't know how that works. Uh, closing, you know, clipping some of those tubes, I don't know how it works, but it's meant to work. And a hysterectomy. How we increase the risk is infertility, endometriosis, and there are other factors. So if you're on the oral cancer pill, oral cancer pill for more than five years and have two babies, you reduce your risk of ovarian cancer by 70%. But I don't know if that's the case for people who have genetic disorders. I don't think that you're protected from that. David will answer that later. And one of the things when I came back from Australia, I know Sam, uh, Dr. Sam Kuro smith ran ovarian cancer screening program in the Rotunda Hospital. Um, in Australia, no gynae oncologist provided that screening um, service. And I think the data to date uh, doesn't support screening in, for the general population of ovarian cancer. So it's not widely used in Ireland. I know we do run a clinic looking at risk-reducing surgery for patients. But the problem with screening is that it's a black and white image. It's an ultrasound. We look at a black and white image. It's not like breast screening or cervical screening. You can see the breast examined and you can see the cervix examined. But over it's, it's really just a black and white image. It doesn't tell us, is there any abnormal cells there? It doesn't predict anything. The only way you can really test is actually do keyhole surgery, which is invasive, and we wouldn't recommend that. The CA125 level, which is a level for monitoring ovarian cancer, not for diagnosing it. And the reason is that, that 50% of patients with early ovarian cancer, they will have a normal ovarian uh, CA125 level. So it's not, not specific or sensitive enough to pick up ovarian cancer. And it can give raised CA125 levels in benign cases, such as endometriosis, fibroids, 
or if you've got a problem with your liver. So what we advise is that we don't screen anybody with the general public who has no family history of ovarian cancer. We probably screen people who have got, who've got a family history of ovarian cancer referred to a geneticist and they advise such as uh, advise screening for those patients who've got a BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, diagnosis. So this comes to the surgery and how do we stage ovarian cancer? What happens when you come into a, a, a clinic where you see a gynae oncologist? Well, the first thing, uh, first thing we do is we kind of, staging is done by surgery where we open the abdomen called a laparotomy or by keyhole surgery, uh, laparoscopic. So sur staging surgery in ovarian cancer, we kind of look at the liver, we look at the bowel, we look at the glands, lymph nodes, we look at the omentum. And I'll just show you a vi short video on this. Uh, of what a normal, excuse me for one take, what a normal pelvis looks like um, in one moment, sorry, no. I do apologize about, about uh, this video, it's fairly poor, it's using my phone. But basically, in the front, that's, a, that's an ovary there we're picking up there, that's a normal looking ovary. That's a fallopian tube, which we think is the causation of ovarian cancer in the genetic patients, the BRCA1, BRCA2. Um, again, we're coming down to the over here and the uterus in front, the big globular structure in, in front. Uh, and we're coming down to these major vessels down here. We've got a ureter and you've got major vessels going down to your leg. And we try to avoid uh, damaging these. And that's your appendix on the right hand side. Sorry, it's a poor quality. But we can see the ureter there. It moves, called vermiculation, and the big vessels going down to your leg. Coming across this is your large bowel. And it's important to understand this large bowel can be sometimes involved in ovarian cancer and sometimes we would take it and the rectum is at the very, very bottom, very bottom down there underneath the uterus. Um, coming up here we see uh, the patient's left ovarian tube and the left ovary. And then, sorry about the shakes in the, in the video now in one moment. And we're coming up along here and that's the pelvic sidewall and that's what we call the round ligament. And these are major vessels going down to the leg again. So hopefully it'll come up and we can see the large bowel as it goes up the abdomen and there's, well, that's an adhe adhesion there. And we come around we see lots of small bowel there and there's some air in the omentum there. That's the omentum that hangs down over the bowel and that's from, a key, this is for a keyhole surgery, it's a bit of air in the omentum. And I'm going to show you the liver now and the, where the heart is. So that's the liver there. It's a big globular structure. And going up there, we have the lungs and we have the heart, and that's protected there by the diaphragm. So that's what a normal anatomy is. So apologies again. So staging for ovarian cancer, there's four stages. Stage one, which really is the cancer is confined to the ovary. And you can see stage, there's three stages in stage one, A, B, and C. A is confined to one ovary. B is confined to both ovaries. Well, see, it's confined to both ovaries, but we take washings or there's some fluid called ascites and they show malignant cells. So that's stage one. It's quite rare, to, it's not common to get patients stage one or stage two. Less than 20% would present with stage one and two. It's more commonly in stage three and four. So stage two may basically means it's confined to the pelvis, i.e. it's not above the diaphragm or above the, above the pelvis here. It's confined to the local structures there, such as the bowel, the uterus and the ovaries. Stage three, it's gone up into the bigger abdomen. It's along the diaphragm, which is above here. It's kind of along the bowel, and it's in what we call the omentum. There are three stages in stage three. I won't go into them. And stage four, which unfortunately has involved the liver or it's involved the lung. So unfortunately, a lot of patients with ovarian cancer present in stage three and stage four. <coughs> So in Ireland, what is the five-year relative survival in Ireland for women with ovarian cancer? As you can see, since 1994, 2009, there really hasn't been a, a dramatic improvement, and that's our lack of understanding of ovarian cancer. But it is improving somewhat with new drugs who are coming on the market. What are the treatment options? Well, any patient coming in with ovarian cancer should have a laparotomy. But depending, some patients will not be suitable for surgery and will need to have chemotherapy first and then go on to have surgery. And then unfortunately there's a small subset of patients who aren't suitable for surgery or chemotherapy and might be referred to a palliative care physician, unfortunately. So this is a patient of mine in Australia and we put patients up in the lithotomy position, basing their legs up. And the reason we do that is that we need to do bowel resection. We'd like to join the bowel back together again. And that's the only reason. So this is the incision we do. We do a midline incision. So it's either 
below the umbilicus, which is up here, or above the umbilicus, going right up to the breastbone. And here's a patient in Australia who we did a big midline incision. And she, you can see there, which we don't do in Ireland yet, is we give intraparent chemotherapy, which are little ports over the left side there. This is the patient who's got a big ovarian mass, which is removed. We removed that quite happily with no disease left. And here's another ovarian mass. They're not very pretty and they're horrible looking things. So surgery stage is mandatory for all patients for ovarian cancer. And it gives us an idea, do we need to give any further treatment? If it's confined to the ovary and, we, and there's no disease outside, well then the patient may not need any chemotherapy. So for those patients who aren't suitable for chemotherapy initially, and one of the reasons are that we look at the CT scan, we see there's a lot of disease around the liver, or we feel that we can't get all the disease out in one taking, we give that patient chemotherapy. And we usually give three cycles of chemotherapy, and then the medical oncologist would order a CT or we'd order a CT, and we reviewed the CT at our multidisciplinary meeting. Then a decision would be made, has a patient responded to chemotherapy? Because only 80% do respond to chemotherapy initially. So of that 80%, if it's a good response, we would offer surgery. So there are some patients who are off of surgery in the first time, but we see, see a lot of advanced disease, and those patients will need quite a bit of surgery. So we usually take their uterus, their ovaries, floating tubes, their omentum, but sometimes we need to take their spleen, um, their spleen, which is there. But also sometimes we need to take their, their bowel. Um, this patient is one that we did during the week, and she has a lot of mucin-producing tumor there which unfortunately we couldn't remove at all and should have chemotherapy later on. And here's a patient who had her bowel and her uterus together. Her uterus is on top and that's a cervix there. And this is her rectum and her bowel there that was involved in a tumor. The advantage of that is that we've got all the tumor out. If you can get all the tumor out in one sitting, in one operation is the best for that patient. I'll explain, explain this. This is a lady who had her bowel removed, but unfortunately we couldn't join it again, together again. And if we look at this picture here, that's showing the inside of the patient with her large bowel going up and around and coming out in the skin. And this is a patient last week who had an operation, operation and that is called a colostomy. And that is a large bowel coming out of the skin. Now, it is a devastating thing to have a colostomy, but sometimes they are reversible. So you always think of the positive side. The only reason we give somebody a colostomy is that we want to get all the tumor out of the patient. Sometimes we do a small bell out in the skin, that's called an ileostomy, and that's a picture there. Ileostomy is actually very reversible, and patients do very well if they, can, if they have no recurrence of disease. And this is one we did in Australia, and it's quite an enormous amount, but this is the gold standard to try and get all the tumor out as much as possible. So we want to achieve this. This is definitely in a pelvis, there's no disease there. And we can see the major vessels that you saw in the initial video with no, with no peritoneum on them. And there are the major vessels going to the leg and the ureters. And I won't extract, but you can see the blue, that's an external ileic vein going down. So there's no disease there. And that's our goal as a gynae oncologist, to get as much tumor out as possible, to zero centimeters of disease. So I apologize for the slide, but it just shows us it shows on, on the y-axis the proportion of patients surviving and on the x-axis the months of, of patients who enter the study. So when they enter the study, when they have their surgery, they until 48 months. And you can see on the top one that this line above here shows that those patients who have no disease left after primary surgery and have chemotherapy, their survival is greater than those patients who have greater than two centimeters left after surgery. So the whole idea is to get down, get the, all the tumor out to zero centimeters of disease. That's our goal. So when you, when you finish your surgery, finish your chemotherapy, there's usually shared care between the medical oncologist and the gynae oncologist. And we advise we see each patient we've seen for the first two years, every three months, between the gynae oncologist and the medical oncologist. Then for the next two years, we see them every six monthly, and then yearly after that. When you come to us, you do have a physical and uh, uh, examination and a full history was taken. You'd also have a pelvic examination and most likely a rectal examination. 
and you'd have blood tests done. And depending on your symptoms, you may have a CT scan performed. So what is the risk of recurrence for patients? Well, it's quite high. Um, it's around practically 60%. It could be higher. And so when a patient comes back with recurrence, how do we know they've got recurrence? Well, from their symptoms, they might have new symptoms of abdominal extension, they might have weight loss. Most patients would have an idea that something's going on. They also might have a raised CA1 to 5, or we find something in the CT scan. So what are the options then? Well, unfortunately, the majority of patients would be referred on to medical colleges for second line or for adjuvant chemotherapy. They might be on the same type of chemotherapy they had before, or they might be on new types of chemotherapy or the patient might go into clinical trial. The second option, it might be supportive care where the patient is very, very unwell and does not want to have any further chemotherapy and would not like to have any further treatment, which is quite rare. And the third type would be surgery. So depending on the CT scan, if we see isolated disease, in other words, one or two spots in the patient and they're feasible to go into surgery, we would do that. And how we test for that, those patients will go for a PET scan um, and we'd identify, is there a lot of disease left or is it isolated? So here's a PET scan, and on the left scan, it's showing a normal PET scan. And these aren't the same patients, by the way. It's a normal heart, and a PET scan is where we give radioactive glucose to the patient, and unfortunately, cancer cells love this glucose, so it's taken up by cancer cells, and identifies patients with recurrence with tumors greater than a centimeter. So if we just see an isolated spot, maybe just say in the liver, or in the liver, or in the lung, we can take out part of the lung, part of the liver, and therefore the patient has no more disease and would have adjuvant chemotherapy or might be observed. If there are multiple spots, unfortunately in this patient here, we can see up in her chest, she's got disease in her chest and her lymph nodes, well then that patient would not be suitable for second line chemotherapy or for surgery and would go on to have chemotherapy. So on that note, thank you very much for listening.